All right, so this is the final section in the Basics of Believing series, at least for now anyway. As mentioned before, if anyone has any questions or comments about any of the topics discussed in this particular series, please leave them on those videos. And we can always come back to this series and add new sections to it based on that feedback. So one of the things that we really focused on in this series was how Christians are justified by both faith and works. That's really all there is to it as far as how to be Christian. Have faith in Jesus and do works that demonstrate that faith. Those two steps pretty much cover everything a Christian should do if they would like to inherit eternal life. Now, all that being said throughout the series, we do want to clarify something that is very important. While a person's faith and works do justify them, there is a whole lot more going on behind the scenes by God when it comes to being saved. So for this series, we just looked at the basics of believing. Pretty much, if you wanted to get started as a Christian today, what would you have to do? So this particular series really just focused on the person's part. Kind of like if I made a series on the basics of how to get to the lock screen on my iPhone, I get to say you press this button or you press this button. That's how you get to the lock screen on my iPhone. But again, that's just looking at our side of things, what we would have to do to get to the lock screen simply press the button. But there's a whole lot more that went on behind the scenes as far as manufacturing this product, and we had nothing to do with that, unless of course you work at Apple, in which case you might have had something to do with that. But for the most part, people don't have anything to do with all the behind the scenes work that goes into making that happen. But just like our task with the iPhone here was made possible because of a lot of other work that was done behind the scenes, not by us. The button press is our part, but our part wouldn't work at all if it hadn't been for the other people who already set up everything so it would work. Our part of having faith and doing works, that's only possible because God did a lot of work beforehand that allows for faith and works to do their role. So as we close this series, we want to make sure that people understand that the faith and the works, that's our part as Christians, but we're not getting ourselves saved all on our own. And that's not to say that faith and works are entirely our part, but just that we have a role to play in those areas. The folks over at Apple made the effects of this button press possible, and God made the effects of faith and works possible. So let's see where we can learn that in the Word of God. Paul writes to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. And he tells them that they were dead in their trespasses and sins, in which they once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom they all once lived in the passions of their flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. So Paul is telling these Ephesians how they used to be. Basically, they used to suck at being Christians, which a lot of us, myself included, do. He then says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So we have a bunch of people who were dead in their trespasses and sins. Paul calls them children of wrath. And God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved them, saved them. By grace they had been saved. So these people were not sparkling examples of Christians. They were still dead in their trespasses when God made them alive together with Christ and raised them up with him and seated them with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward them in Christ Jesus. Paul then reiterates and elaborates, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So even though in this Basics of Believing series we were focusing on what Christians should do in order to stay saved, we wanted to make sure we also looked at Ephesians 2 because even though faith and works do play a role in being saved as we can see throughout the Bible, this passage in Ephesians lets us know that God is still the one who is doing the saving. By God's grace, Christians have been saved. As Paul tells the Ephesians, being saved by grace through faith is not their own doing. So whose doing is it? It's God's. God is the one doing this thing. It is the gift of God. Now there are some Christians who teach falsely about that passage in Ephesians, and the way they go about it doesn't really make any sense, which we'll see in a moment, but basically what they do is if you read here it says, this is not your own doing. Paul says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. So this is referring to what Paul specifically just talked about, and he's letting them know that that particular aspect of being saved is not their own doing. But what false teachers of Christianity will do is they'll take that this, and instead of just letting it say, this is not your own doing, they'll pretty much change that entire statement to say, nothing about being saved is your own doing. So let's watch as a fellow Christian by the name of Alan Parr tries to explain this passage from Ephesians. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So notice what he's saying here, three things. Your salvation did not originate from you, it originated from God. Okay, so stopping there, Alan has that part correct. The salvation being discussed here originated from God, not the people. So Alan is a true teacher of Christianity on that particular bit of information. However, he's about to be a false teacher of Christianity on another bit of information. 
So let's watch. Your salvation has absolutely no dependence on your works and your performance. What Alan just taught there is not found anywhere in Ephesians, and it's not taught anywhere in the entire Word of God. What Alan just said there is a false teaching of Christianity. And it's very easy to see how it doesn't make sense. Alan just got done telling us what this verse talks about. Your salvation did not originate from you, it originated from God. Alan lets us know that the salvation being discussed here originated from God not the people. But then from there, Alan makes this huge illogical leap to say this. Your salvation has absolutely no dependence on your works and your performance. Now if Alan were to add the phrase, in terms of its origination, then he'd be correct. Because in terms of its origination, your salvation has absolutely no dependence on your works and your performance. As far as creating your salvation, God can do that all by himself. He doesn't need you. But instead, Alan is removing this specific aspect of salvation that Ephesians 2 is talking about and turning that into the blanket statement that your salvation has absolutely no dependence on your works and your performance. Which is a false teaching because in some ways your salvation has absolutely no dependence on your works and your performance, but in other ways your salvation absolutely can have dependence on your works and your performance. And later on in the video, Alan even claims this. Your salvation has nothing to do with whether you do good things or bad things. Again, if he were to tweak that just a bit and say your salvation's origination has nothing to do with whether you do good things or bad things, then he could be correct. But Alan is removing key portions of the teachings and instead ends up making false blanket statements such as this. Your salvation has absolutely no dependence on your works and your performance. There is absolutely nothing in all of God's word that proves what Alan just said there. What Alan is doing there is he's starting by telling us how salvation originated, and that's with God, not the people. Again, that's the part that Alan got right. These verses here in Ephesians do answer the question of whose doing was it. And that answer is that it was God's doing. It is the gift of God. But Alan is taking verses that talk about where salvation originated, and then from there he goes off and talks about an entirely different topic. Alan is trying to answer the question of can salvation be dependent on your works and on your performance? Alan claims that the answer is no. Your salvation has absolutely no dependence on your works and your performance. But Ephesians 2 does not answer this question. Ephesians 2 answers the question of whose doing was it? So we already know from the other sections in this series that the answer to the question of can salvation be dependent on your works and your performance is yes. We saw that Jesus taught this, we saw that Jesus' followers taught this, we saw that Jesus' followers also taught others to teach this, and if you go to 1 Corinthians 15, you can see that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So here we have Paul telling the Corinthians that they are being saved by the gospel. But he puts a condition on there. They're being saved by the gospel he preached to them if they do this work of holding fast to the word that he preached to them. So they're being saved if they do work. Notice how that's answering a different question from what Ephesians is answering. Ephesians tells you whose doing was it. Being saved by grace through faith is God's doing. It is the gift of God. And according to what's written in the Bible, even though God's gift did not originate due to our works, our works can still play a role in being saved. So what Alan Parr did there is a common mistake that false teachers make when reading Ephesians 2, and it's kind of a weird one because it just doesn't make sense logically. Like as we saw, Alan did note correctly that this was talking about where salvation originated. Your salvation did not originate from you, it originated from God. But then to go from there and say, well if it originated with God and this is not their own doing, then nothing about it can be their own doing. That just doesn't make logical sense. If I'm having a bowling tournament and you ask me what do I have to do to be in the tournament, I could tell you you can be in the tournament free of charge. You don't need to do anything. Your entry is my gift to you. Alan's reasoning creates a situation where if your works don't cause the gift to originate, then you also don't need to do works once you have the gift. But even though you don't need to do works in order to receive the gift of entry into the tournament, you still need to do works to stay in the tournament and hopefully succeed in the tournament. Likewise, even though you don't need to do works to receive the gift of salvation, you can still do works to stay saved and hopefully succeed in being saved. So hopefully we can help Alan to shake the false teaching and just be a true teacher of Christianity. So to Alan and to anyone who might be in the same boat as Alan, let's get serious here and talk about Rita's. On the first day of spring, Rita's wants you to start spring off right with a free Italian ice. Rita's gives away the free gift of Italian ice. So let's read from the book of Eat Frisians and just, wow, plow right on past that lame pun. Seriously, who wrote this? I want a confession before I go on, all right? Whose stupid pun was that? I will sit here until I get an, you know what, actually, we don't need to waste time with that. Where were we? For by the promotional event, you have been saved from paying for Italian ice through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of Rita's. Eat Frisians, haha, to it.
So here we can see that this gift of Italian ice originated with Rita's. None of us had Italian ice on hand, but we did have a lightsaber, so stand in. Anyway, this gift did not originate with me. It is the gift of Rita's. I have this Italian ice saber because of Rita's. It originated with them, it exists because of them. This is not my own doing. So what was Alan's follow-up claim? Your salvation has absolutely no dependence on your works and your performance. So Alan is claiming that the gift that originated with God has absolutely no dependence on your works and your performance. And he's basing this off of a couple verses in Ephesians that don't say anything about that. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So notice what he's saying here. Your salvation has absolutely no dependence on your works and your performance. So let's do what Alan did and make a claim based on what's written in Eat Frisians, haha, <laughs> even though Eat Frisians, haha, <laughs> doesn't back up that claim at all. This gift of Rita's has absolutely no dependence on your works and your performance. Let's find out if that's true. Here's a work. I open my hand. Okay, so now I no longer have my free Italian lightsaber. What does that tell us? It lets us know that even if the origination of a gift is not your own doing, once you receive that gift, which originated elsewhere, the responsibilities of maintaining or holding on to that free gift can be your own doing. So the point is these verses in Ephesians don't tell you anything about whether works play a role in maintaining that free gift or holding on to that free gift after you've received it. But it's fine that those two verses don't talk about that because if you look at the rest of the Bible, you can find places that do talk about that and do answer the question of can works play a role in being saved? The answer to that, as we've seen throughout this series from Jesus, his followers, and the teachings of the Bible is yes. And actually the very next verse in Ephesians says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So right after Paul gets done telling them that their works did not cause this gift to originate, he still makes sure that he tells them that they should walk in good works. And even as you continue on in Ephesians, he's urging the Ephesians to do work. He writes, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Paul continues to keep listing works throughout Ephesians. Be imitators of God. Walk in love. He tells them that sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness, that's a hard one to say, covetousness, I think I got it, must not even be named among you. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking. Instead, let there be thanksgiving. And then he tells them this, and remember, these are saved people that he's talking to. Paul told these saints who are in Ephesians that they have been saved. So when writing to the saved Ephesians, Paul says, you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. So Paul is addressing people that he believes have already been saved, and he tells them to take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. And Paul explains that these saved people may be sure of this, that everyone, that's everyone, everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So if everyone who does these works of darkness really has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God, then everyone would include the saved people that Paul is writing to. Which means that they could be saved in the past, meaning that they could have had inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God in the past, and then those very same people could do works that were works of darkness, and those works could cause them to not have inheritance in the kingdom later. Now, just as a quick side note, even though this may all sound very scary to a Christian, please remember that there is forgiveness for sins. So if you end up doing any of these works of darkness, or you have done one of these works of darkness at one point, it doesn't mean game over for you. There is confession. God forgives people for their sins. We'll discuss forgiveness in a different series, but we just want to make mention of it here since just seeing that passage alone could be a bit scary for a Christian. If you want to jump ahead and start learning about that now, feel free to check out John 20 or 1 John 1. In John 20, you can read that the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. 
And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. And 1 John 1 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we'll also put some links down below in the description in case you want to learn more about forgiveness. Paul then concludes that passage by telling those saved Ephesians to again do a bunch of works. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time. Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. If we go over to what Paul wrote to Titus, we can see that Paul also explained to Titus that God saved them not because of works done by them in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. But again, just because we see that God is saving people according to his own mercy, and we're learning that this was not because of works done by them in righteousness, that doesn't change the fact that works can still play a role in maintaining or holding on to that gift after they've received it. And you can see in this passage here that Paul actually sandwiched that teaching with two other teachings about doing good works. Paul tells Titus to remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. Paul says that the saying is trustworthy and I want you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. And going once more to 1 Corinthians 15, I just want to reiterate what Paul said there. I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. Being saved is a process, and that process can continue if people do the work of holding fast to the gospel. As Paul taught Gentiles in Rome, Note the kindness and severity of God, severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. So again, we're seeing a condition here. If they do this, then this can happen. Provided they continue in his kindness, then God's kindness will be to them. Otherwise, they too will be cut off. So God starts the process, and God saves people on his own. This is not their doing, it is the gift of God. But after that process has started, maintaining the gift very much can be their own doing, at least in part. And I say at least in part because as we read already, God prepared good works for people beforehand. So if someone is walking in those good works, it's still only partially their own doing, because God had a hand in making those good works possible too. So that's all for this series, at least for now. Again, if you have any questions or comments on anything discussed in this series, leave them in the comments below, and we can always come back to this series and add sections later to address that feedback. As we pointed out, this series was looking at the basics of believing. We focused on what people should be doing if they want to be Christian. We looked at a little bit of what God is doing behind the scenes to make all this possible, but that and more are topics for a different series. We were focusing on what Christians should do. We can have a different series on what God is doing. We looked at the button press, but we didn't look at the apple factory. According to Jesus, his followers and the teachings of the Bible, Christians should have faith in Christ and do works to demonstrate that faith. But know that God's doing a whole lot more work behind the scenes than we're doing when it comes to being saved. And I specify that because some people don't like what the Bible teaches about works. And they'll claim that if works play a role in being saved, then it somehow becomes a works-based salvation. Alan Parr says something similar to that. Christianity is not a works-based religion. To say that you have to continue keeping up some perfect standard or continue to work in order to somehow get into God's graces is to suggest that Christianity is now a works-based religion. To say that since works play a role in being saved, that it's now a works-based salvation, would be like saying that since Neville Longbottom plays a role in Harry Potter, that means that Harry Potter is a Neville-based book series. That doesn't make sense. Harry Potter is a Harry Potter-based book series. Neville plays a role in the series at times, but it's not Neville-based. Likewise, salvation is God-based. Works do play a role in being saved at times, but it's not works-based. Even though Christians should have faith and do works to demonstrate that faith, being saved is God-based. By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. So until next time, this is How To Be Christian, and this, well, this is not Italian ice. You have a, ow, 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 the beam is going into my leg. It's, it's got me right in the knee. I'm kidding. It's plastic. It's, 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 not, it's not real. All right. So yeah, you have a great day. <laughs>